I'm moving, moving forward every day. Jesus, I just let him lead the way every second. Eyes wide shut. I don't for one moment believe that John chronicled this incident in his gospel simply to declare that Jesus has the power over blindness. John is too bright to just simply record an incident to tell you that Jesus has power over blindness as we continue to examine john's gospel we see he's developing the concept that blindness is not merely a condition of the eyes but but blindness is a condition of the mind he is not so blind than he who will not see and so much that when god spoke to nicodemus he told him you cannot see unless you are born again here was a master of israel leading the flock of israel but could not see no wonder jesus calls them blind guides because they could not see i read a statement once and i wish to share it with you it says cataract is the third leading cause of blindness religion and politics are the first two it seems to me John wants us to see a correlation between Nicodemus and this blind man in John 9. John wants us to understand that the beggar man's physical condition is just as bad as Nicodemus's spiritual condition. Both of them are blind. And if God, Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again, it implies that Nicodemus was born blind. Oh Lord have mercy. You know, hear me church. John is juxtaposing these two characters so that we would understand that both men were born blind. Both men had a problem and so he's using this blind man in John 9 to paint a picture, a sad picture of his own church that was blinded by its own blindness, that could not see, that grew up in darkness because they will not see. They could not see because they will not see. And so this blind man in John 9 is an epitome of his own own church that was born blind and John is provoking us to see the two Nicodemus and this blind beggar man are on the same platform because both of them are blind have mercy to be born blind in this predicament worries me because it seems to be pastor that John is sending a stern message of caution to all religious advocates. Stay with me now because, you see, Nicodemus was a religious man. And John seems to be saying to Nicodemus and all those who are religious, no matter how ardent and fervent you might be, your religion can prevent you from seeing the light. Oh, my pause raises as I see that. Your religion can prevent you from seeing the light. Let us go to John chapter 8 verse uh, 58. Because I want you to 59, I beg your pardon. John chapter 8, it's verse 59. If I give you 58, I'm sorry, but it's 59. 59, John 8, 59. Then took they up stones to cast at him. <laughs> but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them and so passed by 
Oh, you, many of you missed that and I hope you are not so blind that you couldn't see what is happening in this text because what is happening is a parable of what happened Jesus is going through their midst and they didn't see him that's a parable of what just happened because he was in their midst and they didn't see the light oh Lord have mercy <laughs> how many of you have ever experienced the reality of looking for something all over the place only to find out it was right in front of you all the time I've seen some people looking for their pair of glasses and they're worried they're sweating and the moment they try to wipe their brow they feel the spectacle on their forehead uh, this is what you call hidden in plain sight Jesus was right there but they couldn't see him because they were blinded that this is what you call eyes wide shut where they refuse to see him Jesus the light of the world is shining brilliantly in their presence but because of their inability to see they couldn't see him right in their presence hidden in plain sight oh I wanted to tell you that there is a danger when your eyes are wide shut could I tell you some of the dangers of being so caught up in your own opinions? Your eyes are wide shut. You see, when your eyes are wide shut, Jesus could be blessing you when you think he is testing you. Uh, Jesus could be healing you when he could be hurting, when you think he, he is hurting you. Jesus could be leading you when you think he is leaving you. Jesus could be watching over you when you think he has forgotten you. He is right there in your midst. Two gentlemen can testify on their way to Emmaus. They were walking with sad countenance and Jesus showed up in their presence but because of the sadness because of the great loss because they were grieving the tears blinded their eyes that they couldn't see Jesus right in their midst Jesus kept quiet but he kept on walking with them I'm saying to you when you're going through your dark days you don't hear a word from Jesus you don't hear his voice but it does not mean he is not there he could be walking right there with you you got to still open your your eyes and see his presence there somewhere I read he is nigh unto them that have a broken spirit and save it such that be of a contrite heart hallelujah sometimes we are too blinded to see him why because we are caught up with our own opinions some of us don't want to hear any opinions but our own echo we want to prove our point of view we want to establish our own thoughts and our own beliefs that's when your eyes are wide shut and if you don't know what i'm talking about just examine the war between the pro-vaxxers and the anti-vaxxers pro-vaxxers don't want to hear anything from anti an anti-vaxxer doesn't want to hear anything from uncle i mean from pro-vaxxer because your eyes are wide shut you have made up your mind that this is the side upon which you stand and you will not want to listen to another voice i'm saying to you brothers and sisters when your eyes are wide shut jesus could show up but you don't see him he could be touching you right now but you don't feel him you want to know what is all of this religion about because your eyes are wide shut these two chapters pastor are being placed side by side chapters eight and nine are being put side by side juxtaposed to with each other to accentuate this dilemma let me illustrate to you very briefly in chapter eight to the ones who could see jesus says i am the light <laughs> in chapter 9 to the one who could not see he gave him sight <laughs> because Jesus knows that light is not no value to the one who has no sight are you still here with me in chapter 8 he hides from those who could see 
In chapter 9, he reveals himself to the one who could not see. In chapter 8, Jesus is rejected by those who could see. In chapter 9, Jesus is worshipped by the man who could not see. In chapter 8, Jesus is called a demoniac. In chapter 8, yes, verse 48, he is called a demoniac by the ones who could see. But in chapter 9, the blind man calls him Lord. Are you still here with me? The one who could not see. And I am forced to ask, which one of them was really blind? Oh Lord have mercy. Jesus wants us to understand you could have your eyes wide open and still not see the truth. It makes you wonder whose eyes that Jesus needed to open. For we are told at the end of chapter 8 that Jesus passed by the ones who could see. But he stopped by the one who could not see. So darkness was a way of life therefore to him darkness and growing up in darkness was normal stay with me i'm going somewhere with this is is normal yet what was normal to him was not right because there was no light <laughs> The first lesson, therefore, this beggar man would learn is that though it is normal, doesn't make it right. Help me, help me somebody. Though it has become normal, it does not make it right. And I say this because I hear some people arguing, Pastor, I was born this way. It's in my genes, it's in my DNA to behave this way. God made me this way. You have heard the argument, haven't you? Huh? And there are people who talk like that and maybe there's some scientific and biological reason to substantiate your view But being born this way doesn't make it right Because if your lifestyle has no light Then it's not right Hello somebody, it's not right And if you believe otherwise, then it only shows how blind you are because because it has become your way of life you think that if it's not your way then there's no other way but i've come to present to you the one who is the way the truth and he is the light and without him your life is in darkness the good news is though this man was born this way jesus was prepared not to leave him this way you should have shouted amen i don't know why though he was born this way jesus was not going to leave him this way he he stops by you despite your darkness but he does not leave you in the dark do i have any witness here aren't you glad that jesus stopped by your house aren't you glad that jesus stopped by your pew aren't you glad that jesus stopped by your way aren't you glad that he interrupted your journey aren't you glad that he visited you visited you when you were on camp when you were in that car when you were driving along your merry way when you were on the dance floor he came by you and he stopped by you and he didn't just stop by you to identify with you but he was determined not to leave you where you are and so right now you can say it's a great change since I have been born again do I have a witness thank you Jesus thank you Jesus he has called you out of darkness and brought you into his marvelous light and so the Bible tells me pastor that Jesus sought to change his condition by going to the earth to get some mud <laughs> he went to the earth and when i examine jesus this guy is awesome nothing jesus does is by chance because jesus could have simply told this man open your eyes and it would have been open in fact he is so powerful he could have just thought it and the man's eyes would have been open you all believe that He's awesome. He doesn't have to do anything. He could just say the word. And the man's eye could be open. But he went to the earth. 
Wait a minute. Why did he go to the earth? <laughs> well, let me, then let me give you what the Lord told me. You see, this man was born blind. He did not become blind. His was a congenital disorder, which means he was born this way. His problem was based on his origin. <laughs> his problem started with his origin. So I am not shocked that Jesus went back to the origin. Oh Lord have mercy. The Hemi Church. He went back to the origin because I made you from the dust of the earth and your problem is from the origin so I'm going to redo this thing I'm going to start over again he went back to the origin thank you Jesus oh Lord have mercy and maybe that's how he made man in the first place he may have used his own saliva the Bible didn't tell us he used water except it could have been the water from his own mouth and he used it and he mingled it because he wanted them to see I'm going to start over with this man you need to be born again this time with my hands you came out of your mother's womb but I'm going to start over so that you will know that when you start to see you, everybody will know it's because of the power that resides in me Jews had a philosophy that the saliva of every firstborn child, every firstborn son, had healing properties. Yes. <laughs> oh Lord have mercy. That was their belief. I'm saying to you, Jesus doesn't do anything by chance. The Jews had this belief that the saliva coming out of the mouth of the firstborn confirmed his status and it had healing power so that it was used to heal other people so in so much that some rabbis when they were approached by other citizens about some ailment they will often tell them go by the firstborn he has healing properties in his saliva i'm told that many people had eye ailments that were healed by the firstborn but none has ever been healed who was born blind <laughs> So, 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 so it, it is clear to say that no firstborn's saliva was ever responsible for healing somebody who was born blind. Here is another firstborn who is about to change all of that. All the other firstborn could not heal this man born blind. But my saliva has power, has healing properties so that everybody would know I am the firstborn sent from God and in me there is life and my life is the light of men. Hallelujah! Oh! Nothing this man does is by chance. He is trying to let us know that I am the true firstborn. Hallelujah. <laughs> and he did not bother to address what caused the blindness. He was more interested in curing the blindness. <laughs> the disciples are disciples. These are pastors. Because it was taught then that every ailment had a spiritual connection. So they came to Jesus with the philosophical and theological question. Jesus, tell us please, of what origin is this blindness? This is not just an ordinary blindness. This is congenital blindness. Is this man's sin or was it his parents who sinned? And there are people who are always looking for the cause of your wickedness. There are people who want to keep you in the past by reminding you how you got here. Are you still here with me? <laughs> and so they ask, what is the cause? Why did they ask, what is the cause? I'm so glad that you asked. They asked, what is the cause? To certify that his condition was justified. Stay with me. They wanted to certify that his condition was justified. <laughs> 
And while they were asking for the cause, Jesus was looking for the cure. Because while they wanted to certify that his condition was justified, Jesus wanted us to know you don't have to qualify in order to have your condition modified. <laughs> Hallelujah. You don't have to qualify in order to get my blessing. I don't care what caused it. I am the cure for it. I don't care where you have been and who caused you to be where you are. Stop blaming your parents. Stop blaming your, your territory from which you came. I have the cure. In fact, I am the cure for your ailment. So while others are looking at your past, Jesus is trying to fix your future. So let people continue to talk about your past. There are those who will always see you in the context of where you were. But Jesus sees you in the context of where you're going. His problem started when he got better. Everything was all right when he was not. <laughs> mm -mm. When he could not see, help me Holy Ghost to say this the way you want me to say this please. When he could not see the light for himself, the leaders were happy. Why were they happy? Because once you are blind, you have to depend on us. <laughs> you have to depend on us to lead you. You have to depend on us to find comfort in the church. You have to depend on us to praise God. You have to depend on us to worship God because you're blind. They were threatened the moment he started to see. Oh Lord, this is frightening, brothers and sisters. Once he remained blind, he will have to be dependent upon everything they told him to do. But it wasn't that he had a problem with the church. It wasn't that he had a problem with the leaders. He just met the light. <laughs> and sometimes, oh, help me, Holy Ghost. And sometimes when you see the light, it may cause you to feel or to appear as if you are going against the leaders. He didn't have a problem with them they started to have a problem with him because he saw the light for himself and i'm saying this because many of us follow blindly the church but in case you don't know let me informate you jesus is not coming back for a church he is coming back for individuals. He says, "Whosoever will." He is not coming from from a. He is not coming back for a label. He is coming back for every person. So make sure that your experience is not based on the oil of somebody else's lamp. You have got to find Jesus for yourself. You have got to see the light for yourself. Hallelujah. And I know what it is to be there, brothers and sisters, because I used to preach according to the rabbis. <laughs> Help me, Holy Ghost. I used to preach according to the dictates of what I thought I had to do. But when you meet Jesus for yourself, when you see the light for yourself, it excites you. It animates you. It causes you to do things that you would never thought about doing. I must begin to wind this thing up. <laughs> to let you know brothers and sisters on at least four occasions i'm going to read it for you in your hearing on at least four occasions these men began asking this blind man some pointed questions let us go to john 9 9 and verse 10 john 9 and verse 10 therefore said they unto him how were your eyes open he answered and said, a man that is called what? Come on, a man that is called Jesus made clay and anointed mine eyes and said unto me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And I went and washed and I received sight. Verse 15. I want to read all the time. Then what? What's the next word? What's the next word? Then? Then what? 
Again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received the sight. He said unto them, he put clay upon mine eyes and I washed and do see. Verse 17. Verse 17. They say unto the blind man what? Again, they're harassing the man. What sayest thou of him that he had opened thine eyes? He said, he is a prophet. Let's jump in to verse 24. <laughs> verse 24. Then what? Again, they called they the man that was blind and said unto him, you better give God the praise. We determine how you praise God. You give God the praise because we know that this is a sinner. In other words, don't praise the one who healed you. Praise God. The same thing. <laughs> they didn't know it was the same thing. You're praising God. You're praising Jesus. Same thing. Same thing. But, but they know. You see, they sat in Moses' seat and they could determine who is sinner and who is not sinner. Verse 25. Look at his response. Then he answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. Another version will tell you, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't agree. But one thing I know, oh Lord have mercy. <laughs> I, I said one thing I know. You can call him whatever name you want. But one thing I know, whereas I was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah! One thing I know, you could sit down and debate all your theology and philosophy as much as you want. But one thing I know, I may not know all the 28 fundamental beliefs, but one thing, oh Lord, I'm one thing I know. I was blind. I was a drunkard. I used to party. I used to smoke. I used to run around. But one thing I know I was. Verse 26. Then said they to him, What? Again, what did he do to thee? How opened he thine eyes? Wait a minute, let's pause there for a while. By the question, they were confirming the miracle. Because earlier, they were saying, we don't believe he opened your eyes. Let's prove that he is not the same guy. Let's ask his parents. And when they ask his parents, the parents say, well, we don't know, you know, he's of age. Ask him yourself. Because they didn't believe. So now, their question seemed to suggest that they knew he could now see. How open he thine eyes verse 27 look at this one he answered them i have told you already and you did not hear wherefore would you hear it again you all want to be disciples or what now they better be grateful that this man wasn't a trini no no seriously they better be thankful he wasn't a trini oh gosh how much time you keep asking me that you come the first time, you ask me if he's a prophet or what he is. I said, he's a prophet. You ask me what he did to you. I said, he told me to go to the pool. I wash my eyes and I'm seeing now. You come back again. You ask me, how did he open your eyes? I said, I just followed what he told me. No, you come back and ask me again. What happened to you all? You want to be a disciple? You want Bible studies or what? Is that what you want? You want Bible studies or what? Leave me alone. I can imagine the man's exasperation because they keep pestering him and coming after and after. But little did the man know that with every question that they came with, he was strengthening his faith in Jesus. He, he, he was moving. <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy. He, he moved. Wait a minute. He moved from saying a man called Jesus to worshiping Jesus. Are you still here? I don't know him, but now he is worshiping. He graduated in moments, which tells me that God sends, God oftentimes sends opposition to strengthen your conviction. Oh Lord, have mercy. <laughs> Hallelujah. They were doing him a favor. He was upset, but he was getting stronger. He said, hey, one thing I know. I was blind, but now I see. He was dictating to them. And the next verse he said, verse 28, is am amazing, I'm going to close with this. Verse 28, then they reviled him and said, you are the disciple. <laughs> you all didn't read that. You all not seeing or what? You are his disciple. The man never met Jesus. The man never could see. 
but by the way he was defending Jesus oh Lord he graduated hallelujah you have to be his disciple I'm saying you don't need to go through a six month course to become a disciple you just have to know what Jesus did for you hallelujah you just have to keep your eyes open because what he has done he ain't finished yet he continues to do even more you've got to learn to trust him in spite of what ye you have been through because Jesus is still looking for people whose eyes are wide open he is looking for people who are willing. Lord, help me through this difficult time. I don't know what you are going to reveal, but just reveal yourself. We have not begun to know Jesus yet. That's why he gave us eternity, because there's so much of him to learn. We must never come to the point of saying, like Nicodemus, we know who you are. Because the pandemic will teach you that what you know is not what you ought to know you have to be willing to open your eyes and once you're willing to search he will reveal himself you won't discover him he will just open the curtain because he will learn that you could only see as much as your eyes could accommodate and when he sees how much more he will open the curtain a little wider that's why I'm saying to you, people who get deeper in God will never leave it. Let me say it another way. The deeper you get in Jesus, the more difficult it is for you to turn your back on him. No, I did not say the deeper you get in religion. There's nothing wrong with the religion. But religion must not become your God. Religion is just a conduit to introduce you to Jesus. And the deeper you get with Jesus, the more difficult it is for you to turn your back on him. Mind you, you will argue with him. You all will fall out. You will ask him some hard questions. And you might even say, is Jesus, is he me and you? I've done. And the moment you turn, you will turn around again because he has placed so much word inside of you so much of his spirit inside of you he can trust you with the trial he knows you will get upset he knows he might even point your finger but then he will still bless you he knows our frame he knows we are dust and i'm sure many of you have argued with the lord before but you're still here with him do i have a witness here somebody who has have your hard questions but you're still here because the deeper you get with Jesus, the harder it is to turn your back on him. Leslie, you believe that? The deeper you get with Jesus, the harder it is to turn your back on him. So this morning, I want to appeal to you, keep your eyes wide open. Keep your heart wide open. Keep your ears wide open. Let him talk to you. Don't let anything veil your presence or veil his presence. But remove everything and let Jesus speak to you.